Expo 67 was referred to by one journalist as the greatest thing we've ever done as a nation. And the London Observer actually claimed that the event gave connotations of sex appeal to a word that previously never conjured up any, Canadian. 50 years later, these statements of praise, bordering on the hyperbolic, still characterize memories of the event. Now, Toronto, to be clear, was not actually that involved in the organization and staging of Expo. This, this is a Montreal-centric thing that was also in large part directed by the federal government. Now, there were modest contributions, um, but this focal point, I think, of the, of the Canadian Centennial Project was not going to be Toronto's time in the spotlight. Now, while Toronto was peripheral to the quote-unquote greatest party of the 20th century going on in Montreal, the relationship between Toronto and Expo 67 reveals different, even divergent ways in which the modern movement in architecture and urban planning played out in both cities. Now, that Montreal would host Expo 67 was not necessarily a foregone conclusion when the idea to host Expo first came up in 1958. The federal government didn't want to invest themselves in the possibility of the good old-fashioned classic Toronto-Montreal rivalry for hosting the exhibition, making this quite clear in one cabinet minute from October of that year. Toronto actually did consider the feasibility of hosting a world exhibition on the CNE grounds. However, this encountered resistance from the mayor's office when push came to shove in 1960, at which point the federal government had to submit its formal bid to the Bureau of International Expositions. When asked, Nathan Phillips supposedly replied, give it to Drapo. He'll go broke. <laughs> the bid was submitted with Montreal in the end as the host city. But Canada actually lost that bid for the uh, 1967 exposition to Moscow. And then two years later, Moscow gave it up. So Canada had to try again. Canada got it again, and then Toronto tried again. And got shot down. Stephen Baker claimed that Toronto had had their chance, and they turned it down. So stop asking. And that was that. I've noted that turning down the possibility to host mega events, this, this has become a very Toronto thing to do. Starts here, keeps going. Place Ville-Marie, Place Bonaventure, new roads and highways, and a metro. In the decade of the Quiet Revolution, Montreal's downtown core is completely remade and refashioned, as the city is aggressively refashioned into what contemporary commentator called an urban laboratory, and what then-Mayor Jean Drapeau called the North American City of the Future. Montreal contains many significant examples of the, of the then avant-garde in architecture and urban planning of the time. It is the only Canadian city with a complete built urban freeway network, and its downtown is rife with brutalist architecture. The upcoming deadline of Expo 67 necessitated the construction of numerous building and infrastructure projects simultaneously, as did the newly, cultural and newly culturally and economically ascendant French-Canadian majority of the province, which was demonstrating its symbolic power in the construction of a new skyline. This era still in large part defines the look of the city's downtown core and reoriented the city's business district from the traditionally anglophone Rue Saint-Jacques in old Montreal to then Boulevard Dorchester, now known as Boulevard René Lévesque. Despite Montreal's modern boosterism, most of all led by Drapeau himself, the modern movement in architecture and urban planning certainly did not begin and end with Montreal. You might have asked the planners then, what about Don Mills, Scarborough College, a design competition for City Hall? The works of Peter Dickinson or John Parkins? Canada, Montreal is not Canada's only urban laboratory in the 1950s and 1960s. The international modern movement in architecture and urban planning is present here as well and being experimented with. This persistent narrative that I've encountered time and time again in my own research, particularly in press reviews, that Montreal is a, is a Canadian modern metropolis while Toronto is a poor old provincial backwater is just obnoxious. However, the modern movement, I think, was more enthusiastically embraced in Montreal, where the city's aspirations to become an urban laboratory were, more in, were intimately connected to the aspiration to host successful Expo 67. Indeed, it was hoped by contemporary commentators and planners that downtown Montreal and the experimental architecture of the Expo site would serve as influences on each other. As the islands rose from the St. Lawrence River, so too did that new skyline I referenced. The Expo, Expo 67 really remade Montreal as the power of the provincial and municipal states and commerce were harnessed to refashion huge chunks of the city in a way that doesn't have a direct analog in Toronto's context. There, international modernism encountered more significant local and institutional opposition, even in its heyday. In Montreal, for instance, 
opposition to freeway construction in the 1960s was simply ignored. There was a deadline to hit, and neighborhoods be damned. During that summer of 1967, the spotlight was placed squarely on Montreal, on the two magic islands in the St. Lawrence River where Expo took place. Toronto made direct contributions to Expo, though I really should emphasize again that these are modest in scope and character. It was about $44,000 of trash bins. Seriously. And there were a few benches thrown in there too for good measure. That's the contribution. 15, uh, just a bit over 15,000 Toronto students visited Expo as part of an organized excursion through the uh, TDSB entitled Operation Expo, part of Expo's planner's idea of facilitating intercultural exchange. As well, one of Expo's chief commissioners, Robert Shaw, did propose a Metro Toronto Day at Expo at one point, but I don't believe it ever got off the ground. There's some resentment, I actually note, in the contemporary press from Toronto's business community that so little was seen as being done to represent and market Toronto effectively at Expo. Officials with the CNE were also concerned that Expo would take away business and attendance from the long-running yearly fair, an event which historian Keith Walden has noted was integral to the formation of modern culture in Toronto. But Toronto architects did make their mark on some of the most important structures at Expo 67. The signature piece of the Canadian Pavilion, the inverted pyramid Katimovic, was designed by Rod Robbie. As arguably the fair's signature piece of architecture, it did feature in much of the promotional material. Macy Dubois designed the Ontario Pavilion at Expo. The Toronto architecture firm Robbie, Vaughan, and Williams actually submitted a not so well known plan in September of 1967 that sought to redevelop the Expo site into experimental housing, I mean, think habitat writ larger. Um, that would house about 25,000 to 30,000 people, although the city of Montreal quickly ended up rejecting this plan. I'm the second person to do... Oh, can, can we see that clearly? There's no way we can dim the lights, can we? How's that? That's a bit better. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Um, I'm the second person to talk about uh, talk about the sort of formative role of the TD Center. As Placeville Marie did for Montreal, Mies van der Rohe's TD Center did for Toronto. In both cases, the skyscrapers were opportunities for the host cities and key commercial tenants to brand themselves and their respective skylines as newly ambitious and modern. Again, in both cases, New York developer William Zeckendorf played a pivotal role in pioneering in, in, in the first couple of years of both projects. Both towered over the pre-war central business districts and, as noted earlier, radically reoriented their respective urban environments. Like the TD Center, Placeville Marie in Montreal, feature, which was featured back in, in slide two, the sort of white cruciform skyscraper, I'm sure, I'm sure many of us know it, um, transformed the skyline of downtown Montreal and reoriented the new business district around it. Though modern architecture in Toronto itself was rarely featured overtly at Expo, in keeping with the larger program of Toronto sort of being on the sidelines, it did appear in some of the content shown in, at the Ontario Pavilion, particularly in the film A Place to Stand. You know, a place to stand, a place to grow. I'll stop. Ontario, area, area, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, many of the film's urban scenes are quite general and somewhat placeless. While the urbanity of some images suggests that they were filmed in Toronto, there's an absence of clear markers of place. Not so in the later part of the film, where several clear and identifiable images of Toronto are projected on screen. Now this was a multi-screen film, of which there were actually a whole whack at Expo. So multiple images are projected simultaneously onto the screen, contra compared and contrasted with each other. So what we have to do is in the end sort of like pay attention to framing and prominence. So when Toronto has its moment in the spotlight, there are three moments to unpack, two of which are in this image and one of which I'm going to pull up afterwards. First, I think it's, it's it's key to look at um, what sort of structures, what, what works of built form did the architects choose to, to represent Toronto. Um, in the center of the screen, I mean, the most focal point is the TD Center, um, declaring the arrival of international uh, style modernism in a way that dominates Toronto's skyline and sparked competing development around it, like, uh, like Placeville Marie had in Montreal. And the second, um, uh, the second is, uh, again, the Thorncliffe Park Towers, right there on the, uh, on the uh, bottom left. Um, once considered part of a, quote, 
utopia of planned environment, unquote, by one of its creators, the neighborhood, I mean, certainly has since faced challenges since, despite being innovative and, with, and well in line with the avant-garde of the modern movement at the time. Both examples of modern architecture in this case are, chose to, are chosen to represent Toronto as the same. I think it's, it's important as well to understand the other three images are all urban freeways. Um, perhaps one of the most poorly aged aspects of, um, of 60s modernism in urban planning and architecture. Um, top right, I, sp I spent a bit of time over the past little while trying to figure out where these were and I got two out of three. Um, I'm quite proud of that. Um, top right's the DVP and 401 interchange. The top left is, is the interchange in between the 401 and the then Spadina Expressway. Um, I don't know what that is. I have no idea, and the picture quality, unfortunately, is not doing me any favors. Um, nonetheless, um, I, do think it's, I, I do think it's important to note in this case that when Toronto does get its moment in the spotlight, it does so in a way, uh, or, or it's shown in such a way that, um, that urban freeways are considered an integral part of the city's modernity as it's shown at Expo 67 to the two or so million people who ended up viewing the film. In the third case, oh, again, it's very dark. Um, if, you, if you can make it out, it's, uh, it's City Hall. And it's just one image of City Hall. And this is the important thing to understand about how this is a multi-screen film. And then for the image of City Hall, it's just one. Um, it's, a, it's given a focal point. Um, so that alone, I mean, indicates to, to us, the viewer, and, and then, um, the ways in which the filmmaker were using uh, the filmmakers were using Toronto City Hall as a means uh, as as a as a sort of symbolic focal point of modernism in Toronto, they afforded it an image all its own, which they rarely did in the film. It was considered a key point of marketing uh, of marketing modernism, modern architecture in Toronto to viewers of the film. Chris Armstrong, historian Chris Armstrong of architecture actually argues that New City Hall was an unqualified success in the minds of Torontonians and a triumph for a new variant of modern architecture. Its focal placement indicates that the filmmakers agreed. Toronto did take, uh, did get some things out of Expo 67. Caravana has its origins in the Centennial Project and Expo, as its organizers imported the performance from the Trinidad and Tobago Pavilion for the duration of the uh, inaugural festival. And there are some sculptures too. Not certainly not as influential, but certainly present. Um, on left is a miniaturized version of the um, of Alexander Calder's monumental sculpture Man. Though this one isn't so monumental; it's about eight feet tall, and it's been unceremoniously kind of placed behind a Starbucks at York University's Keele campus, where it doesn't get a lot of uh, foot traffic. Um, on the right, uh, Louis Archambault's sculpture A Tall Couple. It's found at U of T Scarborough. I mean, itself, a brutalist megastructural masterpiece. Both the Czech and Yugoslavian pavilions at Expo were offered by an investment firm to Toronto. And, and they both ended up as cultural centers in the Maritimes instead. We didn't get those. These sorts of wildly ambitious modernist mega projects that characterized urban development in Montreal in the 1960s did come to Toronto in full force in the late 1960s, perhaps, uh, perhaps riding off the uh, euphoria of Expo 67. Fresh off the success of the, uh, of the domed US pavilion um, at Expo, Buckminster Fuller proposed a Project Toronto, which got nowhere, and, uh, and then there was also CN's Metro Center to note um, a bit later on than that, both of which sought to totally reorder space in, down in Toronto's core and invent something new. In a recent, and I mean, and I mean in both, and even with the Metro Center, you, you really only get a convention center in the CN Tower in large part out of it. In a recent piece on urban renewal in Canadian history, geographer Richard Harris notes how little was actually done in Toronto in the end. And perhaps this is fortunate. And the modern movement, though it was present in Toronto, did not so radically remake it as it did in Montreal. But there is this. At least in the contemporary press, one New York Times editorial positions the Ontario Showcase as a direct response um, 
Ontario Showcase being Ontario Place as it was first known in 1968 for, in 1969. It positions it as a direct response from the government of Ontario to Expo. Um, it was described in one New York Times editorial as a mini Expo and elaborated on by then Premier John Roberts as an attempt to emulate Expo 67's approach in, com in quote, combining recreational, educational, and cultural facilities. Robert went on to claim that, quote, we shall utilize the natural setting of the waterfront, modern structural designs, and attempt to create the mood of gaiety and openness which helped make so popular the Ontario Government Pavilion at Expo 67. And what of Expo's legacy in Montreal? This is where I'm doing a lot of my research right now, trying to explore the two or so decades aftermath. There's not a lot of good news. Montreal Mayor Jean Drapeau proposed that Expo become a permanent World's Fair on October of 67. In this effort, he encountered strong resistance, again from the city of Toronto, including its then mayor, who was concerned that if Man and His World, as Expo's continuation was to be known, received federal funding, that it would unfairly compete with the CNE. Back in, back in 1967, the CNE had seen Expo as an opportunity to draw international visitors to Expo to Toronto as well, and it sponsored a billboard campaign in Montreal to this effect, as well as producing a special centennial program. The CNE's attendance that year in the end was not really adversely affected by Expo, and Denison had little to worry about in the end. The old Expo pavilions themselves crumbled away, neglected, over the following two decades, as the city's plan to convert the Expo site into a permanent fairground sputtered out and became, to be generous about it, a poorly attended gimmick. In this way, Expo didn't end with a bang, but with a whimper. Coming back to that point about the ways in which expressways feature prominently in sort of marketing material and mid-century modernism, much of Montreal's road infrastructure was intended to be a long-term legacy, including the Decary Expressway, Bonaventure Expressway, and its Turco Interchange. These are all now dilapidated, while the latter two are being demolished. Though Toronto beat Montreal to the expressway game with the opening of the Gardner Expressway several years in advance of Montreal's first urban expressway, and ended up building about only one-third of the total length Montreal did, if Toronto had hosted, how different would the city have looked? How would hosting an expo have, or, or any equivalent large mega event have totally re-engineered Toronto space as well? Would we have been refashioned as thoroughly as Montreal did? We'd probably at least have a Spadina Expressway, maybe a bit more. Remember that because, Mont because of the deadline of expo, Montreal ended up building a lot of its modern architecture that was in the planning books. It was accelerated. By the time, uh, by the time the, um, by the time the planning and construction got underway in Toronto in many cases, the city and perhaps culture at large had developed a more ambivalent relationship with its own experience in the modern movement. Many of these plans instead were contested, challenged, or outright cancelled. Now, a centennial legacy is more modest than in Montreal, and there was no greatest party of the 20th century to be had here. And I think in, because of that, we, that, in large part, we have that to consider in, in terms of the urban environment that we do have relative to Montreal. Thank you.